Kia ora, I'm Stephen Fleming. Hi, I'm Sarah Ulmer. Together we'd like to take you on a short journey into the heart of an approach to coaching that has been increasingly adopted by coaches both here and overseas. As we learn about New Zealand coach approach, we'll see some top New Zealand coaches in action, learn about how they go about their business, and share some great techniques that you can add to your coaching toolbox. It doesn't matter if you coach cycling, netball, bobsledding, rugby, darts, bowls, surf, lifesaving, softball, croquet, golf or triathlon. You could be coaching football, hockey, badminton, table tennis, gymnastics, water polo, underwater hockey, any Paralympic sport, martial art, where there just isn't a sport that can't pick up something valuable from New Zealand coach approach. Whether you're teaching little nippers or Olympic athletes, this presentation is for you. Welcome to New Zealand Coach Approach. Oh, I think a number of things make a great coach. One is definitely passion, and the great coaches I've had something to do with, they inspire you. And one of the big things is they keep extending you all the time and challenging the way in which you think. So, yeah, lots of different fundamentals, but I think too the core thing is that great coaches care about people. I think a great coach is someone that as a group of players at the end of a season want to come back yeah. and have a great, you know, they've had a lot of fun, they've learnt a lot, they've challenged themselves, they've developed as people, they've developed as cricketers, they want to come back next year and have as much fun. I think the most satisfying thing at a coach in New Zealand community level is, is to help young people become better people. Certainly you'd be honest and you'd be upfront and you have to be caring, you have to care about your athletes as well. Surely one of the greatest buzzes for a coach is to see their athletes in the zone, in the moment, playing their hearts out. But how does a coach create more of those moments to allow the athlete or team to show all their skill and passion? Well, every coach has some of the answers, and we've brought some of the best of them together in New Zealand Coach Approach. So if you see people under pressure, turn them. The secret ingredient is to understand your coaching context you're working in, to really understand the context so if I'm a junior coach, what do I need as a junior coach to, to help these players and get the best out of them? And as a senior coach, what do I really need in this context? If I'm working with a New Zealand team, what do, I, what do I need? What will these players need from a coach in this environment? And if you understand that, then you've probably set yourself up with a journey, a lot of different journeys to get yourself better. I think some people say you're born to coach. I like the fact that when you have knowledge and you're parting, I like seeing the the look on people's faces when it finally it gels for them and they've worked it out themselves. And I think uh, one of the thrills I get out of coaching is when I hear players saying my words back to me when they think it's actually their, their words. And, I, and that's not selfish, that's just saying he understands it. One of the very early prerequisites in being a coach is you have to love young people. You have to enjoy being with them, you have to be prepared or see, see their futures and watch them fly. You know, you, you get enjoyment from watching them achieve. So what is the New Zealand Coach Approach? It's time to find out. The New Zealand Coach Approach is a method of coaching which primarily focuses on three key things. Building athletes' awareness in the moment, getting them to take responsibility, to own what's happening on a daily, monthly, seasonal basis, and to build their self-belief, because we know that a major part of sports performance is in the mind. It's all about the learner in the end, they're the ones that need to experience the, the thrill of learning and the passion about it, so I think from a coaching point of view, if I can get past my me wanting to do well, it's not about me, it's, it's really listening and, and feeling what, what the, uh, the learner wants to do. I certainly like to have the players give their input and feel like that uh, they have ownership of what is going on within the team. and. Uh, even the situations at hand and how they're being dealt with and I think it's just important to get that understanding for your players and try to get a bit of a feel for when they need the arm around the shoulder and when they need a bit of a kick and most players will will tell you that they need that at different times. Over the next few minutes we're going to look at how the New Zealand coach approach is effective at getting athletes to learn and improve. We'll look at coaching styles that range from telling the athletes what to do and how to perform to coaching styles that are more interactive and empowering. We'll explore the powerful role that self-awareness plays in the lives of our top athletes and how you can bring it into your team or coaching environment, whatever the level you coach. Research has shown that the answer to many a coach's challenges may lie in the question. 
Feedback is another of the powerhouses of learning. We'll check this out in the art of effective instruction. And we'll see learning in a real environment through the use of games and activities. An interesting way to look at a coach is to ask where they sit on the coaching continuum. On the left hand, the coach knows what they want, instructs, and the athlete does as told. On the right hand is a coach who is building self-awareness in the athlete, for example by asking questions. So what style of coach are you, and do you vary your style? When you're doing slow stuff there, you should be getting 15 metres off the wall. When you're doing hard stuff there, you should be getting 12. Your intensity is going up. Not 12 on the first push-off, 12 on the first, 10 plus on every single one in intensity. In low intensity, further. Okay. So you'll notice the ball's gone further just by increasing mm. your energy, increasing your back and through. So after that little grouping, how, how did it feel, mm. those shots? It helped, mentally especially. So maybe more comfortable doing that. You felt more comfortable, more relaxed as you, more relaxed. As you did that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I think a lot of a lot of golf, especially mm. chipping or anything that you're learning, mm. if you're relaxed and your muscles are free of tension, mm. it almost the club does the work for you. The they first thing you looked at doing was getting rid of it. Yeah. 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 But you could have played the ball around and got yeah. the movement. So you need to think a little bit more of how you're going to change the dynamics of the other group because they're trying to do what you're doing, but they're doing it better. Yeah. 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 How about we just clear all the balls and pass between the 12 ice? So, oh, all the so when yeah. are you in yeah. control yeah. of performance? When you got the ball, when you got the ball, you were in control of performance. That's your key goal. Don't worry about scoring until you have possession. Where do you put yourself on our scale? What factors do you think affected the coach's choice of approach? To help answer some of these questions, we've gathered together a panel of experts to comment on different and diverse coaching approaches. Great shot, that's a cover drive. Well done, that's good. The athletes can't be standing around waiting for the coach. You, you know, even from a parent teaching a bunch of young fellas to an elite coach, the athletes have to be consistently moving around between task or game or whatever. As soon as they're standing around doing nothing, you're losing time and it's, it's a wasted session. You got a second chance. Nice shot. You guys done really well there, right? Yeah. Now the most important thing about learning is you can actually do it. So show me what you've learned. Show me your forward defensive shot. Brilliant. Excellent. The coach is probably the least important person in a cricket team. Um, they're really a service provider to the athletes. So the most important thing is understanding the group of people you're working with and the way that they like to work and the way that they communicate and the way that they understand best. And setting objectives that the team buys into. They're consistent things that you would do with a, a junior five-year-old team, which is where these guys started, right through to a, elite, you know, the aces or, or the black caps even. The thing I loved about these guys was the amount of activity and the way the coaches were able to observe. You know, young coaches often, I know when I was a young coach, I wanted to try and fix everything. You know, I was like a doctor moving around and saying, do it this way, do it that way, do it that way. These guys had the confidence to observe, let them play, let them play, and then come in and debrief afterwards. And I thought that was outstanding. So let's just create now that contact that you've got here. This has now become our tackle line. So the contact has happened now. All right, so that line there now is our imaginary tackle line. So what are we trying to do there? Beat the defender. Beat the defender, okay. So what's one of the keys to beating the defender? Uh, taking the weak shoulder. Great. There's an activity we can do here to focus on to help the ball carrier with his uh, footwork. And what we want to do is we're going to work the guy in the middle. I think one of the things that you start off as a coach is you feel like you have to have all the knowledge. And I think as we go through our coaching, we learn that the players are really in the best place to have that knowledge. And our ability to extract the information out of our playing group or our competing group is as, as vital, if not more vital, than us imparting that knowledge. So I think have the confidence to uh, present yourself, uh, be vulnerable in that you can't have all the answers, and be prepared to uh, accept information coming back from your group. Because the information coming back from the group is how they see it. And that's not a bad place to start. 
Yeah, good. So on your steps here, remembering what are our steps we're looking for? Uh, short and sharp. Yeah, what leg are we looking for for to be short and sharp? Uh, right foot. Okay, let's have a look at that and see how we go. Good. How did you feel there? Oh, uh, more dynamic, had a lot more power. Yep, good. And what about you as a defender, what did you notice? I felt like he committed me more. And yep. Great. Got strong and tackle. Yeah, well done. Good. Yeah, that was good, guys. I think uh, what we're working on there is that explosiveness around the contact area. I think you notice if you get in there, you use your fast feet, it gives us a greater opportunity to win that collision area because that's what we're really trying to do. We've worked on winning the race to the advantage line and now we want to win that tackle line area, which is going to work around our evasiveness and our footwork. That was excellent. Well done. It was quite sequential. It started with the basic skill, then moved on to a more difficult, more difficult, more difficult. Um, and, and he took the players through every step in the development of that skill, through a question and answering approach and a, 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 an overview, a commentary at the end. So it was explained and, and even for, for someone who didn't know rugby, they would be able to see the development of that, that, that footwork. The things that I picked up that were good was the summarising of the key points at the end. So there was the questions, there was a response from the players, but then he summarised and sort of packaged it at the end. So they went away very clear of what was expected. Just to pick up, the last question was the question of the attacking player and then the questioning of the defensive player. And he got a two-way interaction there too, so that everybody felt engaged. Offensively, we've got to keep executing. We spoke about it yesterday. Uh, still getting to the spots, all right? getting to where you're supposed to be is an important part of uh, us getting better. Letting the players communicate with you, I think that's a real important part of it. I think finally is as well, just trying to get a feel for how different players learn. Everyone learns differently, we're all different human beings and some people need to be told, some people need to see it on video, some people need to write it down and uh, you got to be prepared to use all those methods. In the States it's more of a kind of a dictatorship, you know, where you do what the coach says, no questions asked. Where now, there's questions asked. You're, you're just trying to get better and so you value their opinion. You know, he's gonna let us talk because he knows we respect him regardless. You know, we're not gonna ever not, not respect him. Uh, CJ, what are your thoughts? Yeah, pretty quiet for coming into another big game. I just think that we need to, that's why I come in with the energy. Yep, Bear, your thoughts? Blue did a better job towards the end there of taking, a, taking the three away. But overall, I think the intensity was pretty good. If you have an opinion on how something should work, you should express that opinion. It's for the good of the group, and if you don't say it, you're actually hurting the group by not saying it and, and holding on to it. Um, and again, with that avenue of communication, we've been able to create an environment yeah, where no one gets penalised for it and everyone feels like that they should speak up. And no one ever looks at them like they're an idiot. It's a little bit of a reflection of what the coach is prepared to accept and if the coach is prepared to accept it and encourage it from his players, I think the players will do it. If the coach doesn't accept it or the first time a player does it, he shoots him down and tells him he's a, you know, to shut up, I'm coaching the team, you're not going to get it. And it's the, it's the environment that you choose to create. Breakers, one, two, three, breakers. And Andre talked about being able to express your opinions on the team and in the All Blacks we use an expression, enter the danger, um, which is debating issues, um, confronting brutal facts, but also having the ability to disagree and commit after you've debated you know, for, for, for the good of the team and then all go forward together. Yeah, we find in netball that it is an evolution and it's about trust, that they feel safe to express their viewpoint and are encouraged to in a way that is, as you mentioned, Wayne, that is best for the, you know, the greater good, really. I think that's why, why um, in coaching it's so important to create a culture so that mm. Players can come and go, but the culture remains the same. Mm -hmm. And if players come into that environment and they, they see people expressing their views, they'll understand that they're allowed to do that as well. And um, you've, got to, you've got to, you know, create that environment for them to come into. In swimming in particular, in my area, we need coaches who love children and love swimming and enjoy life. And so they can instill those qualities in, in with swimmers Emanating out of that would be competitive swimming where structure and knowledge become very important and creating systems whereby each swimmer can then progress year to year and achieve, that's part of what coaching is. 
when I started out coaching uh, some 40 odd years ago, I must tell you, I made a lot of mistakes. You know, all I had was enthusiasm and I had been an Olympic swimmer. So I called on where I left off at Olympic level and I was teaching and coaching youngsters of not that level. I was a directive coach when I started out. You wrap that up in love for the children and making things interesting, but really is your call on what people are do, and that's a directive model. My coaching has evolved into senior level swimming, and uh, as the Olympic coach, I'm dealing with uh, not too many youngsters. They're mostly adults, and that's much more, the coach still leading, but in a collaborative manner. And there's a lot more input from the swimmer as far as their feelings and their knowledge as they grow. Great thing for me about Jan is that whole love of the game and love of the people. You know, and um, sports often about uh, generating responsibility in your athletes, responsibility, responsibility for learning, responsibility for performance, and I think that's what what she does. There's no doubting, you know, love for any sport is so crucial if you want to coach. Love for your sport, love for your kids that you're involved with and, and that's really, really fundamental. You've got to have an absolute passion, you've got to live the sport daily, day in, day out, and Jan does that 24-7. One of the most powerful things a coach can do to help athletes perform is to help get them in great shape physically, emotionally and mentally. By raising awareness, encouraging responsibility and building self-belief, that's when amazing things happen in sport. But how, as coaches, do we help get them there? So what we're going to work on today is playing attacking shots with full balls. So that's the drives, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. That's a good shot. Yeah, the only way players can, can adapt and make changes is if they're aware of what they're doing. And they're not going to be aware of what they're doing if they're being told what they're doing. You've actually got to feel it for yourself. And the only way you can do that is, is through questioning, is actually getting players to notice what they're doing in the moment of performing the skill. And not sitting back afterwards and going, right, well, I didn't think my shoulder was in the right position yet. It's actually being able to feel it. Well, I think the whole point of the questioning uh, approach is that you want to draw out the best biomechanical response for that particular athlete. Mm. You know, not what the textbook says, because often it's not the same thing. And uh, when that af athlete feels comfort or discomfort, you know, where they feel most comfort, they're going to execute the, the technique better. What's the scenario attack? What's the... Screen two over. <laughs> two over, so we're going to look to screen, so you guys have got that. Having athletes in the moment is key to performance. We use a lot of scenario based activities. So we'll say, you know, it could be something, for example, you've got 45 seconds to score, you've had a goal defence out of play, uh, goal attacks deep, and set up a situation that could occur on court. Mm -hmm. Second scenario is offside, wing defence. <laughs> offside here, what's the play? Just go across the yeah. Look to swing a triangle. Who's going to take the ball? The, um, go. Goal attack. Nice pass. Thought what we'd do today is actually do a, a chip shot. Okay. And chipping is a shot where you miss the greens and you're uh, challenged with the shot to, to get it closer to the, close to the flag. I think the main thing is whatever works for you. Mm. If you can feel the sense of a rhythm and if the back through works for you then go with that one. When I first started coach I had so much knowledge, I'd come off the tour, been a competent player and thought you know I can do this coaching and I had so much knowledge and I just wanted to pass it on to every student that I had and unfortunately they don't want to hear all of that stuff and so I've learnt over the years to listen more to what they want and not be so enthusiastic by telling them all the technical know how about the golf game um, and keep it a little bit more simple and you know the less is more approach. Now I'm going to start off giving you a, a, an exercise to do just mm -hmm. to get the feel of of what happens in the swing when you play a chip shot and, and I'm going to do get you to give the take three balls from the bucket mm -hmm. and I'm going to get you just to start by standing side on mm -hmm. and just actually getting a feel with your arm for how much energy you need to, okay. to get the ball to travel to the okay. hole. All right. 
most people understand that concept of throwing a ball. And it was more just to give her the feel of what happens with the arm swing. And often when you see learners, when they first try a chip shot, they'll be quite stiff, quite jerky, um, the movement doesn't flow. And that arm exercise is more just to give her a sense of feel and a sense of flow in the, in the swing. So what I'm going to get you to do is just to set up in a comfortable position, mm -hmm. grip it in a comfortable way, and, and just apply that same feel with, with the swing now, with the club in your hands. Just going through the one that makes you feel most relaxed. Let the, the learner hit a ball, and if they do a bad one, so what? Let them experience the bad and then just keep going, because often you can interfere too early and you, <laughs> you want to stick and change after the first shot that they've hit a bad one. You kind of tend to jump in there too early, and, and now I'm taking the approach of just one step back, just wait, because the next shot could be great. <laughs> Because I think we talked about raising awareness with um, with athletes a lot, but you know coaches need to be very self-aware as well. And when you're comfortable in your own skin, I'm sure that you're a much better coach than you know when yeah. you're not. So I like the progressive approach to learning skills: the throwing the ball, feeling the energy needed to move the ball, and then grabbing hold of the club and just relax all the time. Be no, no intimidation about it. Very. The ultimate empowering coach I saw there today, even though she's come off the pro tour mm. by the sound of it and has been a highly disciplined athlete, she's taken a completely different mm. approach to teaching people to play golf. I think one of the ultimate skills of coaching is uh, uh, allowing the athlete to trial and error or teaching them how to coach themselves because if they can do that, um, I think you've succeeded in what you're trying to do. And I think what she was saying there is trial and error, trial and error till you can coach yourself. Then, then I can remove myself and you don't, you, can, uh, you don't need me any longer. Certainly when I'm coaching in a new group like this, I put them into groups and that'll be their positional group, so defence, midfield, attack. And I get them to go away and, and discuss things and then get them to come back and present. So straight away, the leaders will come to the floor. I won't say, I want you to present. So, so then I'm, I start to, to work out, oh, you know, she's, she's a leader. And because I need those leaders out on the field. OK, so the drill we did yesterday, we did a banana run around there and we put, I put a weighted ball through. Let's use the weighted balls up the sideline. The strikers will run into that space. Because a lot of times on this right half, we, there is heaps of space, but just because they're there, you know, just back yourself and each other, that we can get it from one side to another. We've done it great most of this time, but we just need to get it up there and finish it off. We're just not treasuring the ball enough. We, we, we present it too much. You're just showing it out here too much for them to get it off you. And then we well, I like to win and, and all of that sort of thing. Uh, we, we don't talk about winning, we talk about being successful. And if you're successful at, at everything, so that's on and off the field, the winning usually just comes along afterwards. She let them come forward, you know, if, if, um, if they wanted to come forward as leaders, she let them come forward. Uh, she involved them in presenting back to the team. She didn't tell them to, but um, the natural leaders came forward and that allowed her then to treat them as, as individuals. I, I thought that was superb. Winners so often are people who believe they can win. But believing is not enough. It's got to be backed up with clear goals, realistic ways of achieving those goals and the commitment to follow through. And coaches play such a vital role in helping athletes set and reach ambitious goals. The thing to remember is it's got to be based around the players owning the goals. And the goals should be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timed. Every coach will have at least a four year plan, but probably longer if you're dealing with youngsters, they might have an eight or a ten year plan. Year nine, that's where they'll be, and their time for the 200 free might be 209, right? These youngsters should be working on international level skills right from go. Their goal for the next year might be 207. Work should be gradually applied. Session numbers, volume of work, they're gradual applications through the course of a youngster's swimming life. And they're training in here seven times a week and their volume would be 40K. This is London. Right, now these people are your London people. Constantly tracking and monitoring is part of swimming's ethos and it's, it's easy to do because it's objective measure with time. So those times are checked all the way through the season and then at the end of the season and compared to last season's times and of course the world times. So breaking it down, 
evaluating and what do we have to do and why do we have to do that and then achievable steps. The New Zealand Coach Approach puts an emphasis on questioning. How does this work? There's a growing body of research into styles of learning in a variety of fields, education, sport and business, and they all show that short-term telling often has an immediate effect, but the approach that has longer-term retention is the one that involves more questioning and gives the learner responsibility. There are many approaches to questioning. For example, open questions, probe questions, and using comparisons or a rating scale. And the aim for effective questioning, it's about compelling attention from the athlete, enabling positive responses to ultimately help improve performance. So, let's see this in action. So what's our objective out of today's session? Go ahead. So they don't get out, so get they run. can get runs. And why do we want to get runs? To win. To win. To win. The team that gets the highest score wins. So how are we going to defend our wicket? Go ahead. Defensive strike. And what kind of ball would we play a defensive shot to? Ones on wickets, accurate ones. Yeah. So the balls on the stumps we're going to defend, we're going to keep those out. How are we going to score our runs? Ones that wide, are coming out. like kind of on the leg and wide. Yeah, exactly. So if the ball's on our stumps today, what are we going to do? Block it. And if it's not on our stumps, what are we going to do? Smash it. You think you can do that? Yep. yep. Good, OK. All right, let's go. How still's our bat when we hit it, eh? Excellent, mate. Well done. I know when I started using questioning to get self-awareness, um, I, I used why quite a bit, and that created justification, you know? I'd say to a player, why'd you do that? And I'd say, oh, I did that right. No, well, I didn't really mean that. I mean, mm. to describe back to me mm. what you did. So um, I changed to what would you do if you saw this, or how would you do that, rather than why. And, and these guys are really skilled at that. Mm. Yeah. How did that feel? <laughs> yeah. what, did you know this, what did you notice? What did you notice? That, that, that feeling's really important, you know, and, and going with the athlete on that. I, I had a guy, a high, um, high profile guy actually, half back, who um, wanted me to look at his passing. And uh, I could see what the problem was, he wasn't getting low enough. Um, but I asked him what he felt the problem was, and he said he felt stiff in the hip. And I felt like saying to him, You're not getting low enough, mate. But anyway, he felt stiff in the hip. So we just, on a scale of 1 to 10, I got to do a series of passes and said 1 being uh, your, your hip feels really stiff, 10 being feels really loose, um, let's have a look at your pass. And so he started off and um, as he started getting up the scale of 6, 7, 8 of his passing, his hip felt freer but what it did, it took his body weight mm -hmm. down and, and took his body position down and his passes started hitting the hands harder. Right or left, which is your strength? Which is the best turning side? The questioning techniques used hugely in coaching. The first point of it is checking. You need to get some clarity that they understand what you're asking. Jodes, with your head, what are you sighting when you turn? What are you, are you hearing the noise or? Um, I'm looking at the wall. You're looking at the wall? Yeah. Where do you think the ball's gonna be? Down the ground, or coming up. Okay, so what's gonna help you sight it quicker? If I turn my head up early maybe? Yeah. The other side of it is that you're really trying to get them to start to question themselves. So out on court they're asking those questions when they're in moments of finding solutions that they're starting to get those questions generated in their head. So a lot of the questioning technique is both a clarity but also a challenge. That's better. Get out of that. That's it. Go to the point and get out of it. Quick feet, quick feet, quick feet. I know when I started um, trying to create awareness in the players um, I'd throw in a question, I'd be itching to, to answer it. <laughs> and sometimes you've just got to let the athlete um, answer the question, uh, do it in a descriptive way, so ask her, you know, what would you do, so they describe back to you, hey, if it's wrong, um, you, can, you can then correct or put them back in the situation and ask it again. And, um, but you, you, as, as soon as you start answering for them, then it becomes instructional and it probably doesn't make a lasting impression. Well, if you don't wait for their answer, you don't know what the next question is. Yeah. And that's how I kind of train myself. I don't know what to ask next unless I hear this answer, mm. because that, that, that helps me uh, question further. Yeah. 
And knowing the activities that they were taking part in, what was so good about a questioning is that they were actually, while they gave the opportunity for the player to have a range of responses, they did narrow the focus so it helped develop that particular co component, like for instance the spatial component. Sometimes people know they've got to ask questions, but they ask sort of quite closed questions and, and also questions that are sort of yes, no, or the, the athlete has difficulty answering. I thought her questioning techniques were tremendous. She elicited a response, they were easy to follow and they were sequential. So I, I thought her questioning techniques were tremendous. I really did. Great tips, coaches. So the way to go for effective questioning is ask, listen, observe, follow their interests and use their words, start broad and then drill down to increase their focus. Feedback is one of the key elements of learning. It promotes the opportunity to assess, reflect and rethink for better understanding. Yeah, Jamie was the first person, so she was just outside the circle. OK, let's get our screens up early. It's, it's not, you know, we're not doing any flash things or anything. It's not rocket science. Just, just get there. It's really good for her to give us feedback. So we know what we're doing wrong and we know what we should, like, what we are doing right. So we know how to improve our game. What's the guard position? Straight back. Yeah, you know yeah, she'll never okay, so completely like side. trade you in the ground, like completely put you down. You know she'll never do that. She'll always be like crit um, constructive criticism. It will always be that. It will never be anything that will make you not want to get back out on the field. So Jenny, we're just going to have a look at your positioning. So in here we've got Jamie, who's your other fullback out here, and Lydia out here, and Queensland have got the ball. I've been using Game Breaker now for, for about two or three years and um, so now I don't coach without it. And so here they have now eliminated Lydia who's our right half, okay, so one of our defenders has now been eliminated. So now what do you reckon your job is here? Well Jamie doesn't really know what's going on behind her so I should tell her to step up. I should tell to make the tackle outside the circle, so definitely release her and tell yep. her to make the tackle step up. Yep. Yep. And I need to definitely move to cover her. Yep. Being able to see themselves is really important because a lot of players don't actually understand what's happening out there. They don't realise. They're not thinking about it um, and that kind of thing. So they need to they need to think about uh, what's happening out there. They need to understand why we might be doing something. They've got right into the circle without even having a stick laid on them. From okay? the sideline. From the sideline. So, <laughs> not, not, not flash hockey, is yeah. it? <laughs> uh, not Talk when about, you it like that. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about putting ourselves under pressure. <laughs> okay, so Jamie backs back, backs back, backs back. Um, and now, now this girl's come right into play and you and Jamie have been caught flat. Yeah, okay? I definitely needed to have shuffled, shuffled Around more. There. We should have nailed them. <laughs> Out on the got 25. To that stage. Yeah. You need to be honest and upfront. You need to be fair. You need to be certainly transparent. I don't necessarily think I need to be their friend. I'm happy if they want to be, but I don't go out of my way to be everybody's friend. And you have to be caring. You have to care about your athletes as well. You know, you have to look after them. You have to make sure that they're given the best opportunity that they can be given. That positive feedback all the time, you know, it was obviously the players enjoyed the feedback too. They yeah. believed that, you know, there was honesty in the feedback. Well, she moved up and down the spectrum, didn't she? Yeah. She went she from did. instruction she did. to questioning and, and back. And knowing too which players are going to, and it would have been hard for her not knowing them that well, but recognising that some don't mind the criticism publicly, um, but knowing too that sometimes that's not good for players that you need to take them aside. The other thing I loved was, you know, the, the video session was the what happens next yep. scenario, yep. you know, which, which promotes real understanding. So not only that, what would you want others to do around you? You know, because it's, cause sports, you know, it's an uncertain environment, it's always changing, you've got lots of people making different decisions. So she's trying to get some synergy there with, um, with, with the girls so that they understand what they should be doing there, but they also what others should be doing. So it's a, it's a team decision making or a unit decision making. Yeah. But the interesting thing was it wasn't what could you do next, but what could we do better yeah. in that scenario as well, which I think is a really big learning curve. Mm. I think the challenge is when, you, when you're looking at video and you're working through that analysis and, and, and checking their understanding and decision making is that they then can transfer it out on the field because some players and athletes are, are very astute and can look at it on the footage and 
that next step is I think the test of their understanding if they can then apply it and the coach being able to say well this is you know what you saw and how you responded and your comments and when you watch it on video now let's see if we can transfer it and under pressure in the real situation. Great work! So just take it back to that situation with Tony again. Just drop it in. Tony turns his back. As he turns his back now, do we need to drop? Okay, so just be aware now, although you're holding a line, there's the opportunity to pressure them and force them where? Further back, away from your goal. So think about that. The rewind, we, we always say, you know, let it run on. So you've seen a moment, let it run on a phase so you can see what the outcome was and then rewind it back two phases, back to when the session broke down. So just some, something simple, you know, press the rewind button before you start coaching. Because if you don't rewind it, you don't create the situation or the picture that was, was actually there at that point. And the players are quite used to it, so they'll get into the right positions. But for novice coaches, you've actually got to work pretty hard to, right, where were you again? Uh, you weren't there, were you? Come on, rewind it back. Think back where you were and just get them back into a habit of that. So rewind just helps you paint the picture and let them see what maybe you've seen as a coach or let them see something completely different that you didn't see. Sometimes for novice coaches, understanding when the coachable moment is, when to actually intervene, and I liked that use of that rewind, but I felt he checked that by getting their feedback. So the less experienced coach wouldn't necessarily have to be perfect in, in their recollection of the situation, but to actually engage their players to do it for them. There are times when the coach has to give instructions and outline to the athlete or team exactly what is expected of them. This is particularly important when it comes to three things. Safety, time pressure and crunch points. Talk fair, good talk fair. Dribble reverse, Rick. there you go. Oh. Help you, dribble, dribble, dribble. You've got to read a little bit what the first guy does, all right, because otherwise Dylan can sit here and play the two of you. So if he chooses to stay high and pop, what should you do here? Because you just threw it to that guy. But you got to dribble it. Because if you throw it there, like we're kind of now, we've got two guys on that side with the ball, like we're a little bit, yeah, we're a little stagnant. you got to go in this dribble reverse, and he can come off or he's going to go, and that's going to drag Kirk out of the corner. But if you throw it to him, we're kind of a little lost. We don't know what to do, all right? Our motion is... Our flow has been interrupted. Often the situation will dictate, you know, you're into a game and obviously the, the adrenaline's pumping. Um, at that stage, it's normally because of the length of time you have to communicate that the communication's pretty directed. And so it's not so much put your arm around people, it's about getting the job done and taking care of business at that particular time. During practice sessions, again, in the team situation, I think sometimes you need to be able to motivate the team and get them going or get the standard of practice up and sometimes you just need to be able to address the player individually where you don't want to call them out in front of the group and it's just, I guess experience is one of those things where you've tried it at different times and you see uh, how players have reacted or responded afterwards and that's something that you can only learn over time. I think the important thing there is that comfortable teams don't win. You know, you've got to have a bit of edge uh, within your team to, to be a winning team. Card, Jim. Played. Hold. Lead, lead, nice. Go, Jen. Play, Go, Jen. Play, Jen. Lydia, we want to use the easy pass. We don't want to put it into their three-man screen. Okay, let's give it to our easy guy. All right. Oh. You have to learn what they're like as a person. So there's some girls that you you can't be hard hard on. Um, uh, otherwise, they just don't respond at all, and they just you know sort of fade away to nothing. And then other girls, I have to have that hard approach to make them react to me and uh, or, or get get out of the, get the best out of them. All right. So a few things to that we need to think about, and we want to see it happening. Okay. So we'll get. When you're doing slow stuff there, you should be getting 15 metres off the wall. When you're doing hard stuff there, you should be getting 12. Your intensity is going up. Teaching skills requires persistence and tenacity. It takes years to develop a great swimmer, years and years and years, because we're not fish. So what is that? That is training. Training your lungs, that they can do work 
without it getting oxygen every one. So on the easy stuff, you should be doing extended breathing so that you're building up your lung capacity. Never breathe off a push-off, never breathe off a turn, and then gradually go, I can now breathe one off the turn, two off the turn, three off the turn, without a breath. Every single push-off that you do, if you do not nail it, you can't expect that it's just going to appear in your race. You've got to make sure that you're doing it day after day after day. Once a game or event starts, the coach is largely out of the picture, on the sidelines. The athlete is on their own. And for athletes, things happen in the moment, in the heat of battle, and they have to react instinctively in the correct way to get consistent and repeatable performances. So one way to encourage this is called TGFU, Teaching Games for Understanding. TGFU is about learning, using game situations rather than traditional instruction. TGFU aims to develop athletes that are confident, can handle pressure and emotions, and can overcome mental blocks and competition nerves. Let's see TGFU in action. Look over to my left. Look over here. Can you see the goal at the far end with the two stumps? Yeah. See the goal here? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to play a game of soccer, except it's with a cricket ball or an incredible. And you can only roll it between your team and pick it up. Roll it. If, it's, if you fumble it when you pick it up, hand over to the other team. If you get touched with the ball while you're running with it or you're trying to roll it to one of your teammates, it's also a handover. Okay. Golski, one nil. Team Martin, change of rule. Okay, the ball's not to go along the ground; it's to go in the air. If you drop it, it's a handover. Okay, but you have to underarm it through the goal to score. <laughs> Bumble. Bumble. Okay, freeze there, guys. Stay where you are. There's a goal here and there's a goal there. Look where everyone is. Where are you? All bunch. All bunch. What do you think you might be able to do? Okay, all right. Where you go. Over on. Hamish. Hamish, Hamish. 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 Ready. Play. You've got to keep the players in game situations as much as they can, you know. Have pitch geography, make it relevant to, to a football game. If it doesn't look and feel like football, don't do it. That's That would be one of my philosophies. And, and certainly tonight, you know, focusing on a defensive shape and letting the players come up with their own strategy and guiding each other to, to an outcome is, is certainly a, a tool that most novice coaches could use. There's lots of way of putting conditions on a session whether it be targets, whether it be you know, modifying the size of your area, whether it be putting specific goals in about you know, what you're trying to achieve. Coaches can manipulate a lot of things, the task, the environment, and the physical load on the players. What came through to me was John really understands that pressure exposes um, the athlete's ability to execute skills and tempo. And if it's a World Cup game, there can't be any more pressure than for those players than that. So the fact that he was he was going back and working on their their, their fundamental skills around a concept that that they might use um, shows a real understanding of what's required at, at that level. That age group, it's easier than when they're in their mid twenties and know it all. I mean, I had some experience with the women's hockey team some years ago of older players and. However talented they were, often under pressure, they resorted back to things they'd done um, in the bad old days when we were trying to change behaviours and change the way things were done. So at the age those girls were at, it's a perfect age mm. to instil those behaviours and he's obviously working hard on that so that under pressure they, they do things right. Fielding team, you can't start from in front of those yellow cones, so you've got to spread out as, as you want from behind those yellow cones to protect that area. How I'm going to do it is I'll just drop it up like that and then you step forward and you smash it. Sharp. You've got to realise it's a lot of fun but it's with a purpose. So at the start of the session, what is the purpose of the session? What are the objectives? These are the kind of strategies we want the players to understand. Just hold it there guys, just one, one sec. Come in fielding team, fielding team come in. So what do you notice is happening with, with their batting? 
Where's most of the, where are most of the balls going? Out that way. Yeah. Out that way? Yeah. Which way in particular? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? So how can you guys as a fielding team make them get less runs? What happens if it goes past this line? What do they get? Two points. Two points. How yeah. are you going to make them get less runs? Uh, coming closer. Right, I'll give you 10 seconds as a fielding team to decide amongst yourselves how you're going to place yourselves to make them get less runs. Yeah. Two goals, two goals, right, one goal. And then you set the game around those strategies to, so the game becomes a problem. The players solve the problem by engaging in the game and then at the end you review it. Yeah, Hamish, Hamish, Hamish! Great throw! Wait, seriously? No! Ah, that's out! Not only are you creating better cricketers who can make decisions in difficult situations and understand game situations and how to adapt to that and, and win, but you're also creating people that come off the park that are better people, that, that have a better understanding of how to be a better person in a team environment and how their input as an individual to a team dynamic um, can help improve the results of the, the whole team. That's a total of 38-45. Well done. Come in, guys. So they need to actually reflect on their learning. The experience is good, and that's where the learning happens. And how can we adapt that into a sad day? You know, yeah. taking that yeah. what you've done in yeah. the training into a sad day. So that only comes with reflection. So you, you do have to sort of bring it back. As a batting team, what were you guys? What were you trying to do? I go for long. Go long. Yeah. Yeah. And then what did you notice when they start to put guys back? What did you have to do? Play short. Okay. Do you do you notice that? Would you notice that in the game? Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're playing in a game and you're staying ahead over the top and they're dropping guys back, what could you then start to do? Play in the gaps. Yep. So just look for singles? Yeah. Yep. So you can see how you can start to have a plan to make the fielding side make certain decisions and the fielding team, you guys can do certain things to make the batters think about things, to change up, okay? Rather than just keeping it the same, the same, the same where nothing happens. Using your, using your brain, it's good. Thank you so much for spending time with us to find out about New Zealand Coach Approach. We've learnt that Coach Approach is a philosophy of coaching which focuses on three key things. Building athletes' awareness, getting them to take ownership, and building self-belief. The New Zealand Coach Approach encourages the full continuum of coaching styles and puts special emphasis on the power of questioning to increase awareness, responsibility and self-belief. We hope you can take some new ideas away to add to your coaching toolbox.